And we are live. Hello, FFLC Nation. How's everybody doing today? Let's see. Let's see a thumbs up or give us a one in the chat. See if you know how to use that chat box. Just type a number one in there so we can see you guys are listening and you hear me correctly. JC, how you doing today? I'm doing great, buddy. How are you? All right, good, good, good. It's a uh, wow, mid-November already, everyone. Um, we've got about 77 people on board, but we are going to start because we start on time now. So thanks for being prompt and being early. Uh, I'm JB. And I'm JC. And uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, we've got all our contact information. So make sure you head out there to FFLconsultants.com. Check us out on all of your various social media sites. If you have questions, feel free to go ahead and email us at info at FFLconsultants.com. As always, if you head out to our social media and have any uh, insights you'd like to share about us and all the services and support we provide, please feel free to comment. And as always, hashtag FFLC Nation. Yeah, and just so everyone knows, we will we are recording a session and we will be sending you a link uh, probably the end of the week uh, when we get back in our offices back in town so that you can share this wonderful information with your teams. So let's get moving. All right. This month's Ask Us Anything is brought to you by Coreware. Coreware is a solution provider offering affordable and comprehensive solutions, including freedom-friendly and transparent merchant services in CoreClear. Coreware offers a robust point-of-sale system in Core Store and a simplified e-commerce solution uh, for Core Fire. Be sure to visit uh, www.coreffl.com slash triple threat to learn more about their offerings. And be sure to stop by Coreware booth at Shot Show to see the, solu the solution in action. They will be at booth 72627. That's 72627 for anybody attending and wants to see a demo of the Coreware product. All right. Thanks, JC. All right, guys, so just so you know, this is November 14th. We are not broadcasting in December, so this will be our last live broadcast for the year. We will be back in January. So please, if you got questions, get them answered uh, today. Uh, you can uh, press that space bar to activate your mic anywhere along the way, or just type them into the chat, into the chat room here, uh, the chat box, and we'll get them answered at the end of our presentation. So today we're going to break it into three sections. We're going to give you the updates. We're not going to go through any numbers today. We're just going to give you real hard facts. Uh, we're going to talk about, talk about the NICS Enhanced Background Check Program. Everyone's uh, going live today, according to FBI NICS. Uh, November 14th goes live for anyone under 21 getting delayed for 10 days if you're in an FBI NICS state. Stay tuned for uh, our session on that. A little bit about ATF rulings. We'll be talking about the new e-form uh, upgrades if you are an NFA dealer. And then uh, we got some more information about ATF stings uh, uh, called into us and communicated into us very recently, in the last month or so. It seems like there's a lot of ATF stings going on or suspe suspected ATF stings. We'll take you a little bit through inspections, but again, no numbers, just three revocations we inherited over the last three weeks. Folks calling us saying, help, we need your help. We got a notice of revocation. We'll walk you through those three scenarios exactly what's happening, unfortunately. We'll give you a hands-on real hard data on our mock audit inspection observations. Just real stuff, no, no words on a slide. We're gonna show you real 4473 um, pros and cons, do's and don'ts. So stay tuned for that. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up with uh, get it right the first time, a session on what you need to do now and going forward so you don't get caught up in the ATF uh, renovation snags, all right. So the Safer Communities Act is continuing. As you know, uh, you should have received email from FBI NICS uh, alerting you to our go forward date uh, today, 1114 of the enhanced background check for all individuals under the age of 21. This is really, really, really important because we, as we're gonna show you in a little bit, we've got revocation, revocations for folks releasing firearms early before the Brady date delay expires. And now that the 18 to 20 year olds are going to have a mandated uh, minimum 10 day delay, uh, this is gonna get a little bit funky. So I want you to know all of the details on how to manage this effective today. If any of you have seen it yet today, please put a one in the chat box. 
We noticed several northeastern states, ha it has rolled out over the last couple of weeks as a, a pilot program. But if you have, a, if you uh, are, if you put a wand in a box, just put the state that you're in also, so we can let everybody know where this is rolling out. But essentially, uh, here's what it is. For anyone 18, 19, or 20 years old attempting to purchase a long gun is automatically going to be delayed for a period, a Brady date exemption period of 10 days. Now that's gonna be automated. So on your MDI report that you normally get on any delay, you will go ahead instead of seeing a three day or, or, or a three business day delay, uh, there will automatically be a 10 business day delay. As far as we know, there will be no proceeds on anyone 18, 19 or 20 buying a long gun or attempting to purchase a long gun. So we see New Mexico, California, Washington. Yes, yeah, so it looks like uh, Southeast, um, Southwest rather, uh, Idaho. Okay, keep going. If you guys have uh, this new Brady Day 10 day extension kicking in, let us know, put it in the chat box. So um, here's how it works. You'll get a delay on anyone 18, 19 or 20. Uh, the delay will require that you to go ahead and key in their address off of box 10 out of 4473. You'll get a return of a delay. Uh, make sure you are inputting that delay date, the Brady expiration date, into box 27C next to delay. That way, no one will make a may make a mistake. Uh, we had we had a, a call earlier today, and a, another idea was to make sure we put in box 32 big letters that say maybe 18, 19, or 20. However old that person might be, put in a big letters up in box 32 so no one misses this and no one messes up. Because if you release that firearm early before a proceed is reached or the 10 days expire, that can be deemed an, uh, an early uh, release, early transfer, and in violation of your uh, background check requirements for holding that through the delay expiration date. We don't want, we have other, as you'll see in a little bit, you have, we have some revocations where uh, revocations have resulted from releasing a firearm one or two days early. Uh, on a Brady date uh, expiration. So instead of five days or three business days, they've released it after two business days or maybe the weekend and the, an employee didn't know. So this can really screw us up. We don't, we don't want it to. All right, so it's 10 days or until you get a proceed from NICS. Well, if that's not complicated enough, it, the outreach program can allow NICS to extend this 10 days if necessary, because they need to check additional state um, uh, regulatory agencies, maybe high school records, maybe juvenile criminal records, maybe some other um, medical records, maybe some rehab records. Who knows what they're checking? They're not telling us except that the states are taking it uh, to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the fullest degree to make sure an 18, 19, or 20 year old doesn't buy a long gun and do something stupid with it. That's what this is all about. All right, so they can call you. If 10 days isn't enough, they may extend it and give you an updated, extended Brady date, uh, release date. And what, what do you do with that? Well, they say, write that date in box 32 and keep track of it. All right, this is gonna get a little, little bit uh, wacky. So you're gonna have Brady date, Brady dates in 27B. You're gonna have Brady date extension maybe in 30, box 32. You're gonna to have to re remind all employees to look at those dates before releasing a firearm. Maybe you want to put in a special program in your store that a supervisor has to look at all of these transfers before they actually hand the gun over. Make sure the dates are correct and make sure you don't release early. That's the key here, all right? So a couple of good pointers there. Where as we come up with more information on this program specifically, we will push it out to you. Uh, if you've registered for this, for this for our Zooms, you will get that email in your inbox. Again, just put that extended Brady date in box 32 and uh, make it big and clear. And again, uh, make sure any, every employee handling transfers, especially delay releases, knows what to look for when examining your forms. Okay. And remember, even though you have a 10 day Brady exemption release date, it is always your option as an FFL as to whether or not you want to transfer that firearm with or without a proceed or after the Brady dead expiration. So you, there's, no mandate, there's no mandation for you to go ahead and release that. If you don't feel comfortable for whatever reason, uh, you know, use your best judgment. 
And again, this release is optional after the expiration date of the Brady date. All right. JC, how are we doing on the stabilizing braces ruling? Oh, stay tuned, folks. We're still looking at December for the time being. Uh, there's a lot going on with this, but nothing's been released so far. So just stay tuned. Crazy. We've been hearing about this, I think, forever through 2018, I think, yeah, this time. Well, yeah, they've been going back and forth for some time, but so well for pawnbrokers just make sure you're just keeping an eye on what you're bringing in watch the news of, of course we'll send this out uh, in an alert to you if anything does does uh, uh evolve um out of what's going on in congress and the house and the atf and whoever else has their their uh, fingers in this decision we'll let you know and we'll give you best practices to manage by Jason. so there's some NFA e-form updates. If you did not receive the email from ATF and you are an SOT dealer or manufacturer, just be aware uh, that effective November 7th, uh, some updates came down the pipe in the e-forms platform. Um, <clears throat> there, there's been a, an account maintenance email address added to the system. This is new. Um, this helps quite a bit as far as uh, your management of your e-forms platform for your business. There is a new train stop, and uh, we got this asked this question earlier today. Uh, what is a train stop? A train stop is just that that part of the form or part of the form process that you're going through that you're currently working on, uh, whether in the future or uh, in the past. Uh, you just work through kind of a train stop process. Um, not much more to it than that. Um, but there has been a new train stop added to the Form 4 for verification of completed application prior to payment. This is actually pretty huge. Um, we've gotten a lot, a lot of phone calls over the last, oh, I don't know, year, six months to a year um, about Form 4s being denied and, and returned back to the original submitter just because something was wrong or incorrect on the form. Something uh, more or less what we hear is the trust uh, isn't identified properly on the form. Uh, that's been the biggest one, I think, so far that we've heard of. Um, so it, the form, the e-form platform is now providing you the opportunity to review the form before you submit it. Um, they added the AR and I-9 blocks uh, to the responsible person train stop on the form one. Uh, this is for uh, the non-immigrant, non-U.S. citizen portion of it. So the form, the e-forms is becoming more aligned with, uh, I would tell you, the 4473 and some of the uh, processes and opportunities you have on the form are now being made available in e-forms for the form, uh, for all the various uh, NFA forms that are out there. Uh, greater validation on the applicant middle name, uh, selection of full initial or no middle name, so you can add that information. We get some errors with that sometimes as well. Uh, the form one, the electronic fingerprint card can now be uploaded. Uh, that wasn't the case before, so this makes it really nice for those of you uh, that have customers that actually manufacture their own uh, NFA firearms. Uh, ethnicity selection is now available in both the Form 1 and Form 4 responsible person train stop and the transferee train stop. So that's a new feature. So you want to make sure with all these additions that you are actually selecting the proper options with those as well. A lot of great upgrades. Um, before we continue, uh, just a quick answer regarding the enhanced background check program that is specifically rolling out for FBI NICS states. But we understand that many point of contact states have either already rolled it out or will be rolling it out. So stay tuned. And if you got questions, contact your state agency. Okay. All right, is the ATF trying to sting you? We've mentioned that we have an upsurge in contacts from our, from you guys and our uh, clients and ambassadors out there in the field uh, telling us that they're getting strange things occurring and they are all suspecting the ATF of doing stings. Uh, we can semi-validate a few of these, but uh, let's, let's uh, explain what's going on and what you should be aware of. And uh, we do believe that there's been uh, an uptick in activities because of this whole Biden uh, ATF compliance program. It just makes sense that the regulatory agency would go to the extra mile to try to figure out how many um, how many uh, revocations they can get while they're at it, right? Before it puts before anybody puts a halt to it. So the first the first straight uh, first thing we are all familiar with is the two person purchase where one person comes in, looks at a firearm, they're with the second person, and the second person makes the obvious 
uh, financial purchase and suggest that they want to have the background check done on them, not the person who is actually interested in examining the firearm. So that's that's kind of out there. It's been out there for a long time. I mean, that was basic, that what we call the basic routine uh, straw purchase attempt of a sting. So be wary of that. And maybe it's imp improving or increasing with the amount of uh, folks that are going through the ATF Academy and they have to train those people somehow when they graduate. And a lot of it is on the job field work and doing such things as uh, straw purchase attempts. Uh, the second one, which is new to us, uh, but we've heard four of these occurring over the last 30 days, which is unusual, uh, where a, a female, it's been a female caller, uh, sound is, sounds educated, sounds scripted, and this person calls and asks if she can have her firearm that she bought on Gunbroker or another online re, uh, firearms retail exchange site, if they can have someone else come in and pick it up for them because they are either laid up or incapacitated or just can't get to the store. So it's a verbal test. It's very unusual, but it, if it happened once, uh, we wouldn't be uh, scratching our heads here because we heard it four times and it's always a female um, person calling and it's been in four, uh, three different regions of the country. So maybe there's a script out there floating around the ATF offices and they, they were told to try to do this and see what they can find out by calling you and asking about online transfers. Uh, next is the out-of-state uh, or expired ID for making handgun purchases. That's also been uh, a known sting practice by the ATF, but we're hearing more and more about it, uh, more of the out-of-state IDs trying to come in and buy a handgun versus the underage or, or expired ID. And then the last one is under 21 buying a handgun or handgun ammunition. You know, as we always say, Make sure you, as soon as anyone comes in, if you're not familiar with your customer, ask for ID, verify their, it's, it's unexpired, it's, it's the real person, they've got their name, address, and date of birth on there. Uh, it's in state if they're looking to purchase any type of receiver, shot, shockwave, uh, other, any other weapon and or a handgun or handgun ammunition. Make sure you get the right ID for the right person. And, and ask for that up front. Don't wait till you get to a 4473 or reviewing a 4473 or background check to ask for their ID. So again, anybody else, if you've seen or felt that you've had a, a recent shop using or sting, you call them stings, you call them ATF shops, uh, put a go ahead and put a number two in your chat box. Let us see where you've had it and put the state that you're in. Let's see if they align with any places we've been hearing about this occurring. All right. I don't know if you've got this call recently, but uh, if you've gotten an urgent trace yet, go ahead and put a yes in your chat box. Urgent trace. Have you been called with an urgent trace? Well, up until about three months ago, we never heard about an urgent trace from, from uh, the ATF. But as it turns out, uh, we've inquired because we're hearing more and more about this. Uh, we got urgent traces in San Antonio. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, yeah, put your state in there if we can see where it's happening. Uh, but they go ahead and, uh, let's see, the trace uh, contractor calls you, the operator calls you with a trace, and they say it's urgent. They start out that by telling you they're an ATF contractor, and when they have an urgent trace, that typically means, from our interpretation and discussion, informal discussions, that someone is probably in custody and has been found in possession of a firearm that is believed not to belong to them. So this is one way to definitely hold somebody accountable for possession of a stolen firearm or to ascertain if a, if a crime has been committed, uh, such as theft of a firearm from a vehicle <clears throat> or from a home. But more importantly, it's a great charge to hold a criminal on if they're also involved in, in more sensitive or more complicated cr uh, cr criminal activity. Uh, holding a bad guy on a charge of possession of a stolen firearm is very easy to do, and they're using that as the urgent trace so they can have that information quickly before they have to release the individual back either without bail or just basically re release them back on their own recognizance, depending on where they are, uh, our, criminal, um, our criminal prosecution programs are a little bit crazy across the country. So do your part and stop, drop, and roll, as we say, and get this urgent trace done same day. 
The contractor will also probably just stay on the phone with you. We're, we're hearing that on, on these traces that they stay on the phone and tell, they say they'll wait until you can go retrieve the 4473. Of course, not realizing how busy you are or how understaffed you are, or if you have time to even go and retrieve those records based on where they might be stored. So, um, you know, kindly and professionally explain to the agent if you can't react immediately to that urgent trace, but make sure you get a call contact number and name and be able to call them, you know, reason, at, in, within a reasonable amount of, about a, amount of time that you think it would take to retrieve your records. Uh, lastly, on any on any trace, go ahead and make sure you uh, retain evidence that you've sent in your trace and responded within 24 hours or hopefully the same day, uh, just to stay off that bad boy list and to alleviate any accusation later that you did not reply to a trace, which is a revocable action under Biden's zero tolerance laws. And then all of the traces, we still call them routine traces. I mean, they're non-time non sensitive, still need to be responded within 24 hours, same day as preferred. Uh, you just may not have somebody in custody at the time and maybe just a firearm found at a location, abandoned, maybe in a stolen vehicle, uh, maybe turned in by somebody who uh, you know just came across it. So, um, you know, routine traces versus, versus urgent traces, please uh, train anyone answering your store phone and getting those calls, how to react accordingly. All right, we've got some revocations. Um, these just came in. So rather, you know, these are what we call case studies. Might as well share with you exactly why or how it occurred so you can avoid uh, getting, getting caught in these traps. And uh, after we explain some of this, we'll go ahead and show you some examples of uh, the evidence, I guess that can, has either led or can lead to these revocation actions or warning actions. Well, let's go through these three scenarios that we're working on currently. And these just came in in the last few weeks. So the first, and, and all of these, um, actually none of these are clients of ours. These are just, these are just folks through word of mouth, either your word of mouth or um, Google or YouTube or something, finding us and saying uh, we need help. And unfortunately, by the time they call us, there's no guarantee that there's going to be any support to remedy um, a revocation. You know, our, our goal and our, what we try to do, as we've explained before, is take that revocation back to a warning, if, if at all possible, to retain your license and, and save your business. So in Florida, we had uh, uh, an FFL and they had a rescinded warning, meaning they got a warning almost a year ago after their first inspection. Uh, it was the first inspection, not doing some things correctly in business for 18 months. Not a, Hello. not a, not a uh, tremendous, oh, JC, you want to grab that? Not, whoever that is, mute your microphone. There you go. Thank you. Anyway, rescinded warning. Um, Give me go park. I've seen going in. I got it. Got it. Bye. Got it. We'll see you inside. Unmute yourself, JB. And then the, there I go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, did he, I started talking about Florida, whereby uh, the warning was rescinded 10 months ago, almost 600, over six, just over 600 transfers in 18 months. And during the first 18 months, with minimal training, as we know from the ATF, um, in, uh, introductory interview and training session where his license was issued and approved. He only had um, two early releases where he violated the mandatory Florida three-day hold or cooling off period they have for anyone buying any firearm in Florida. There's a mandatory three-day, even though these folks were proceeded, uh, unlike most of the states with a pre exemption date, uh, Florida, in, and in some cases it's five days, but three days, uh, he had two where the firearm was released early and they did not wait the full three days and uh, that counted towards his revocation. Again, they were proceeded, but he, 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 he didn't comply with the full, full requirement of the three-day wait, resulted in a, a revocation. Missing certification signatures on three 4473s. 
and again these and these were not same day two firearms purchased two handguns purchased these were firearms purchased on two different days within a five-day uh, session um, two of them included weekend days uh, one was the same week so out of the three um missing uh certification sign research recertification signatures uh, incorrect military personnel transfers uh there's oh, we get probably this is probably one of the more frequent calls we get how do i process an active duty person a military person wanting to buy a firearm and in this case he made some errors with out-of-state driver's licenses and accepting those are PSCS orders instead of the DOD ID and listing addresses correctly. Again, a little complicated. We call these the one-off scenarios. If you don't know exactly how to do them, give us a ring. We walk you through this very quickly and easily over the phone. And he had six of those, unfortunately, is an area where that's highly populated with military. And six out of 650 transfers, I mean, you, you don't think it's a lot, but again, zero tolerance is zero tolerance. Uh, he had 23310.4s not submitted. Uh, that was his fault. I think I was mentioned that just a little bit early. I was talking about that. And again, this was his first inspection. He got a warning uh, just about 10 months ago and two weeks ago received the notice of revocation that his warning was rescinded or pulled back and a notice of revocation or suspension was, was um, substituted. Over in Colorado, um, they had, let's see, date of birth used as ID expiration date. How many times has that happened in your store? Date of birth uh, used as ID expiration date. And it's simply because somebody is looking at that ID when they're writing down information on the 4473 and they simply uh, look at and copy the wrong number unknowingly. So we need focus, focus, focus. Uh, missing recertification signatures or dates. I had five different 4473s. Uh, that either and and had the incorrect date, so the, you know, just little you call these minor errors, and that's why most of our uh, FFLs that we work with are arguing that they think these are minor errors. But under the zero tolerance program, anything more than zero is a can qualify as a revocation. Uh, we're going to talk about this later, but Box Twenty Seven D not updated correctly. He had eleven situations in, at this dealer and FFL in Colorado where uh, anytime there's a delay. And we'll show examples in a few minutes. Uh, any delay must have closure to that delay in box 27D. So they had 11 different scenarios where they did not fully explain the background check conclusion by putting the right answer in box 27D. Okay. Uh, so the shockwave to a 20 year old, we know that shockwaves uh, and the uh, uh, TAC, 40, TAC 14 are sold as 21 and over in state only sold like a handgun. Uh, so he sold one to a 20 year old and that was an illegal transfer of a, of a firearm. Uh, couldn't prove three 334 10.4s were submitted. Again, we tell everyone to keep proof that they've submitted their multiple handgun and multiple long gun forms, either by using uh, email or a fax confirmation and keep those together. And then over in down in Texas, this was really sad. Uh, this is a, a long-term uh, FFL, still in business. Now, these folks are still in business. There's a long process to go through regarding hearings and due diligence and um, uh, depositions and meetings and until you actually get your license actually revoked and you have to sell guns maybe and liquidate. I mean, it's a long process, but uh, just facing that can be traumatic. And this, this fellow in Texas is facing it. Uh, unfortunately, one of his employees, new employees, sold a long gun to an Illinois resident, and there are very strict there's, there's, um, very strict guidelines for anyone in Illinois to purchase firearms. Uh, a resident of Illinois has to have a firearm owner's ID card issued by the state police. Uh, also, they cannot uh, purchase a firearm out of state except in states that are connected to Illinois. So they can't travel to Texas, buy a gun, and carry it back. It's illegal because of that firearm owner's ID requirement and those neighboring states know to check for those. Again, Texas didn't check for it. And um, the state uh, the state regulations are overseen by the ATF inspector, even though they're federal, they're allowed to, 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 to uh, manage 
down to that level and report on those issues. And this is leading to a severe violation. Uh, date of birth used as an ID accept date, uh, as, as an ID expiration date. Same thing with the Colorado uh, FFL. So we have people just transposing or writing down the wrong numbers from the ID. California driver's license with invalid supplementary address documents. So this one's a little, this was a little complicated, but we get a lot of calls on folks from California or some folks with California driver's licenses that actually have homes in other states or properties or summer houses or mountain houses in other states. And in this case, this one customer, uh, because he's allowed to do this in California, he provided and argued that his lease document, his residential lease document on his uh, vacation home was could serve a supplementary address verification. And in fact, in California, it can on the, on the state form, not on the federal form. So you got to be really, really careful when you're dealing with states that have additional requirements. And then missing incomplete NTNs. He had three forms that were not missing NTNs. They had incomplete NTNs. Either had seven numbers or eight numbers and not nine numbers, believe it or not. Uh, and then box 27D was incomplete. And that's the, again, the issue with, if I have a delay, I have to have closure to the delay to the delay on a next background check by checking one of the boxes in 27D and, uh, and maybe uh, being required to insert a date next to one of those options. We'll look at that in just a minute. So these are the three revocations that just came in the last three weeks. It, this stuff keeps us really, really busy working with the FFL to um, you know, unravel everything they've done all year to prevent and be proactive and prevent these types of things from happening. But uh, we, we just have to go ahead and as and be proactive every day to make sure the training's in place and the focus is in place not to let that occur. All right, we're gonna go through some inspection criteria really fast. This is the real stuff. This is stuff we, we have seen on our, our inspections over the last few months. But this is what the ATF inspector sees also. And this is what how they, they we react in the same way they react because basically we've been trained by them, with them, and we understand the process thoroughly. Uh, but looking at this right here, we would want to say that's not, the error is not crossed out with a single line, initial and dated properly to allow for the inspector to un understand what was there prior to the change. Uh, for pawnbrokers, this is actually a good example. We wanna make sure you're doing this right. If you have three guns listed on your form and you're transferring three firearms and you're, they're all pawn redemptions, you're indicating those lines respectively. In this case, all three guns were pawn redemptions. So uh, this box is critical and the identification of the firearms included as pawn redemptions is, is critical to eliminate them from the multiple firearms reporting process. That's what this box is all about. If it's a, pawn, a redeemed pawn firearm, it does not play into reporting for um, multiple handguns or multiple firearms, multiple, multiple long guns. <clears throat> Here's another good example, uh, but we see an error on this very frequently. Uh, in this case, the pawnbroker was redeeming one pawn, meaning uh, somebody you know, pawned their firearm, they took a loan, they paid it off, they wanted the gun back. They checked the box correctly, and, and then here they did indicate it was line one. Even though there's only one firearm listed, you still must include the number one in that box. Uh, we, we find dozens of these types of examples where one gun is listed, one gun is redeemed on a pawn loan, and the, the number one is not inserted in box seven, as you see here. That is a, a, a requirement. All right, now with rifles or any firearm, uh, if it's a completed long gun or a handgun, it has a barrel attached to it and therefore is not, it can only shoot one size caliber bullet and not multi. Um, you should never have multi listed as caliber when you have a completed long gun or a handgun. Multi should only be listed for an, 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 an unfinished uh, lower receiver or frame. This one is going to get this uh, gun dealer in trouble. Uh, when we went through the paperwork, we found not one, but multiple scenarios just like this, where a middle name was entered by the customer. In this case, it's Darnett. And 
the long story short is when they presented their ID to their FFL, put a background check to ensue, it only had a middle initial. So the FFL started requiring the customer to do exactly what you're seeing here. Again, this was not an isolated issue, but we've seen it in, in several different places, several different FFLs, where the name is crossed out so that the name on the form matches the ID. And that is uh, falsifying a federal document because the customer now is falsifying that he doesn't have a middle name. Our FFL is giving that direction, so that's really bad. And then our FFL has common knowledge that this person has a full middle name, but because we don't require Darnett to go home and get a supplementary document to support his middle name, we push it through as an IO middle initial only, and this can get you revoked for falsifying a background check. Okay. This is uh, where, where our employee went ahead and started using American tactical something or other, but changes his or her mind to put Sky Industries. Okay, so it's a Sky handgun, but an ATF inspector is going to pull this aside and go make sure this customer actually was dis had a Sky disposed versus the ATI. Here's a bad example of how to, a customer should not be directed to cross out their recertification date and enter a new date. Let's put one line through the errors. Let's put initials and date. If you notice there's an AC, I believe is the initials there for the person making a correction. We need dates and initials on every correction, whether it's completed by an employee or by the customer. Uh, this is section 21, answering the questions. It looks like they just wanted to answer yes to everything and realized he was making a he or she was making some mistakes. So we went back and uh, I don't know who caught it, whether it be the customer realized their error or the employee brought it to their attention, uh, asked them to review the form. We have some changes made, but this is definitely going to highlight uh, this type of uh, form for the ATF inspect investigator to go ahead and research. So why not just have the customer start over, do a new form, keep it clean, do it right, and uh, alleviate any, any suspicions by the ATF ins inspector during the next um, random audit. Uh, this one is, I want to point this out because this is, uh, a lot of folks are not doing this correctly, but let's look, actually, this is a good example. So in 27C, we have a delay, and we, the delay date, the, the Brady date was 12 8 21. And we re, it looks like we released the firearm because no response was provided. So that's great. And then on 12 9, we checked the NTN uh, NIC status update screen and it, and it moved from a delay to a proceed on 12 9. And I can assure you that a lot of you are not looking at this and updating this box because we never see this updated although we do know the system updates it. Uh, you have to get more attentive to this because the ATF inspectors are now verifying that you are doing this. It was poorly managed for years that we've been doing this, but we're finding more and more violations for 27E not being updated uh, after the firearm was transferred and there was a new NICS status update. Okay, so that's a new, should be a new exercise for you. Uh, 418, delay on 422, uh, looks like we got to proceed on 421. Uh, this is actually great. Make sure we are putting this date in this on this line. If we are missing the date, it will be deemed an incomplete background check. Again, that's what we're having some revocation issues uh, being cited for, not filling in the date, but checking the box, proceed without a date. Uh, a little, a little more on this. This, this is critical, and that's why we're going through all of this. We're finding delay, a lot of delays regarding background check information. Uh, transmitted a day, uh, three twenty-eight. I got a delay. Said I can release it on four one. It looks like no response was received, so I transferred the firearm on four twenty on four one. And I checked my screen or got a phone call, and ATF said, "Oh, it's now a proceed." And they did that on 4-2. So the, customer, the employee first put it up here in box 27D, but wait a minute, that's after the transfer. So we had this corrected and they moved it to 27E. 
Okay, sounds like nitty gritty, but you got to get good at this. Uh, updates before and after the transfer go in different spots on on uh, on delays. Just another um, not so good example of where we probably should have had the had the customer uh, do something different with this. The ATF inspector is not going to like that, and they're going to go to your A and D book with this form and do a lot of extra work. We we want we don't want to do that. We want we don't we don't want to cause the inspectors any extra work. Let's keep it clean and make it easy for them. Uh, box 32, we call this the story box. Write the story. If you got any details at all regarding the transfer, put it in here. And this one was says ATF called 816 and changed response to delay. And then they called back on 816 and changed to proceed. You know, if you got to remember something about the transfer, you might be asked about a year, six months, a year, or two years down the road, put the note in here. Call it, we call it the story box for a reason. Tell the story so that someone in the, in the future can understand what happened. And this one was critical. Uh, we're glad, we we actually are glad we found this one, but this wasn't the only one in this one store where we were. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters in this NTN number. We had to do some research. We were able to look up the next query report and find the nine numbers that went along with this transfer. It took a little work, but by process of, process of elimination, we matched up all the 4473s on this date, and we matched up this number to belong to this 4473. If the ATF inspector found this, it would have been a revocation. Eight digits does not prove you did uh, an NTN or a background check with Nix. Here's your license to carry handgun exemption. Uh, if your state allows for this, make sure you are putting the state label in there, the state indicator. You cannot just assume that because you're in Texas that the ATF inspector is going to assume that it was a Texas LTC. It's critical that you put the right state uh, label in here or indicator. Otherwise, it will be an incomplete uh, uh, background check and an incomplete exemption, and you'll have your license revoked. Okay. or attempted to, you'll get a notice of revocation. All right, just a little bit on this multi. A multi is not a caliber on a completed firearm. We talked about that. Uh, we find this very frequently where a, a completed firearm is listed at multi because the new employee is looking uh, at the firearm. They're told to look at the gun and see what's printed on it. And in this case, it's multi on the receiver, but it's completed. And it therefore will, okay, in this case has the caliber right there on the dust cover, but where they should be looking is on the barrel. If there's a, uh, an, any type of AR receiver that has multi list on it, listed on it, they, the, the firearm will adopt the caliber of the barrel. Okay, never, never, never should it say multi. All right. All right, JC, you are up for some strategies for success. Gerft, you've heard it here first months ago. Get it right the first time. <clears throat> so, again, we harp on this every single month, but we continue to get phone calls from people panicked because they're going through an inspection. You want to make sure that if you've had a previous inspection, there are no repeat violations. You need to get a copy of your report of violations if you received one at your last inspection, make sure you're going through that old report of violations. It doesn't matter how old it is. Make sure you're going through it. Make sure there are no repeat violations. If you've had any type of previous adverse action, that means warning conference, warning letter, you need to make sure that you have no violations whatsoever. You have to be 100%. All right. Remember, if you went through a revocation hearing, and that revocation was overturned and the decision was made not to revoke, you are susceptible to reinspection in a 12 month period. So that, that all falls into the same bucket for adverse action. So 12 months after the report of violations, you are susceptible to reinspection. So keep that in mind. Review every 4473 before that transfer takes place. Train your employees that they are not doing their buddy any favors by just giving the form a, a quick glance. If they're truly their friend, they need to be scrutinizing that form extra to keep their friend out of trouble. So make sure you're reviewing every 4473 before the gun walks out the door. Conduct inventories. We recommend a quarterly basis. 
We also recommend doing firearm counts regularly just to make sure you have exactly how many firearms you should. So that way you can identify a missing, lost, or stolen firearm quickly. Complete those A&D entries late, uh, daily. Make sure this is part of your end of day process. Now, for those of you that are conduct using electronic systems, this is done automatically for you. For those of you who are paper focused, make sure at the end of the business day, no later than you get those A&D entries made, whether it's receipt or disposition of a firearm, you need to make sure that you're recording that information. Remember, JB touched on it. They're out there. They're stinging you. They're trying to get you to execute on straw purchases. So you want to make sure your employees are empowered to evaluate every transaction. And if it feels like a straw purchase, don't go through with it. Make sure that the customer shows you genuine interest and genuine intent. That means look at them like you would look at every customer interaction that you have at your store and make sure they're looking at the firearm. They're asking you questions. They're interacting. They're not just walking in the door saying, I want to see if I can pass a background check or I want to buy seven of the cheapest firearms you have. There are real questions about that, okay? Again, end of business practices. Make sure those of you that have to get those 3310.12s done, those are your Mexico border states. And absolutely everyone must get those 3310.4s done on the same day that the transaction took place. That's the same day that the multi-sale transaction took place. And you need to maintain proof that those are submitted. Uh, keep those receipts, whether email receipts, fax transmittal receipts, whatever the case may be. But you do need to maintain proof that you submitted them. And then JB touched on traces, you know, even those urgent traces. They should be responded to within 24 hours. That's 24 hours of your business hours. So make sure that's getting done. Winning together, we talked about this a couple months ago. If you see something happening out there, make sure you're alerting us as to what you're seeing, whether it's you've been hit by the ATF and they attempted a straw purchase or whatever the case may be. Make sure that you're getting us the information on that so we can get it out to the rest of the industry uh, and get it out to the uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation as well. Communicating that information is especially helpful. Yeah, I know we're all competition in certain respects, but in the end, we can win this together um, because our president has, has basically uh, armed the ATF against us. So we want to make sure that we're doing all we can to win this thing. In the interest of communicating, we had a burger, a smash and grab this morning at 3.30 in Metro Chicago. So if you're an Illinois um, firearms dealer, uh, just outside, actually, a suburb of Chicago, but um, still happening, guys. Smash and grabs, uh, stolen car right through a, a side door with roll-down shutters. It wasn't a glass front either. It was tragic, but they got 30, uh, 28 guns, I believe. So stay tuned for more on that. All right, Restricted States Long Gun Transfer Guide. This is available out on our website, ffllconsultants.com. Just navigate down to the bottom of the page. You'll see that extra bonus uh, button down there at the bottom, and that will get you our extra bonuses, all those different documents and such that we have out there for your use, free of charge. These only help you get things right the first time. Um, that long gun transfer, just remember, you've got restrictions as far as out-of-state residents. No LTCs, no license to carry, no concealed weapons permits. There is no exemption for an out-of-state resident purchasing a, a gun. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're conducting those background checks and you know the law associated with the, the residency of that individual buying a gun if they are an out-of-state resident. ATF Inspection Preparedness Guide. We've got a lot of inspections going on right now across the country. I don't know how many times we have FFLs calling us in a panic. Don't wait until the ATF shows up at your door to familiarize yourself with the inspection process. Get out there to ffllconsultants.com. Download that ATF Inspection Preparedness Guide. Get it today. Get it right. Get ready. That way, when they come a-knocking, you're ready to go and have confidence that you've done it all and you're ready to go. All right, here's where we're going. If we're in a, if, we're, if you're in a city that we're traveling to and want a quick visit, let us know. Maybe we can fit you in, figure out, um, you know, your NSSF membership or how to get you, you know, the membership you need. But this is where we're going right into January already. 
and we, you know, we're booking in February. So if you're worried, uh, give us a call. And uh, if nothing else, let's see us at SHOT Show. JC and I will be out there uh, supporting the NSSF and other uh, client um, vendors that we support. And if you have any interest at all in the NSSF membership, or if you're a regular member one and you, you want to find out how to upgrade to the premium membership, you know, it's for, for about the price of a cup of coffee a day, you can have $25,000 in legal defense fund protection. You can get an entire mock audit inspection by one of us, come out to your location, do a mock audit ATF inspection and establish training protocols for you and your staff and be your everyday 24 seven support consultant. Let us know, just give us a call. And if you're a smaller FFL, please consider, you know, their, their lowest tier membership is hundred dollars. Please support the industry trade association. They are out there running and gunning for you guys every day, both at the national and state levels with the governments. So it's imperative that we get out there, we support them and what they do. JB and I are constantly supporting the uh, industry trade association on a number of different fronts. And we just really appreciate would appreciate your support and what we do as well. All right, All that's right. it. Back we're we're down to Q and A. We're JB, you're going to do a run through, kind yes, of sir. a speed uh, speed question for speed me. Question. There we go. And throw them at me. Yeah, and if any if anyone has questions, just put them in that chat box. Um, yep. All right, JC, what do you do with multiple purchase forms if it was submitted but canceled by the ATF? What to do with multiple purchase forms if it was submitted but canceled by the ATF? Um, that's that's an odd question. I don't know why it would be canceled by the ATF. Um, if you're talking about a, a NICS transaction that was canceled, uh, the only time a multiple sale would be undone is as if something occurred prior to the physical transfer of that firearm. So multi-sales must always be submitted uh, if a multiple sale transfer occurs on the day that it occurred. So yeah, I, yeah I got, I got a call a couple of weeks ago on this, John. And yeah. um, here's what happened is uh, an FFL that they were doing the right thing. And they, tr they actually sent in a form where two handguns were transferred on six days instead of five. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, believe it or not, the criminal investigative inv investigation unit that gets those forms actually called and yelled at the FFL. Uh, for submitting it after five days. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, hey. I mean, if, if it's not within that five day business period, that's your business period. Those are your business days. Um, if you have a multi sale that occurs day six, seven, eight, um, that doesn't need to be submitted. It is literal five days. So, in that case, uh, the case that JB described, uh, you would remove that form and destroy it. There's no reason for you to use it or keep it. Yeah. And if you keep it, just keep it separate in your tickler file. There you go. Yep. All right, where do we enter Rossi? Oh, this is a good one. Where do we enter Rossi in the AMD book if the if it's manufactured by CBC and imported by Braz Tech International? All right, so manufacturer importer will be CBC, the manufacturer, and then Braz Tech International will be your importer. And then in the model, you can actually put Rossi. So you can include Rossi in the model information. And, and like we always say, more is better than less. Yep. So if you don't know where to put it, put it where you think it's best fits. Yeah. So Rossi CBC may not be a totally wrong answer. You know, it's partially right. And you got extra information in there. Just remember that, you know, when that, when your trace request comes in, that means that firearm has been recovered for whatever reason. And to supply that information to the officer, that just tells him a story about that firearm and information to look for. All right. Thank you, everyone who put in those ones and twos and fours and states. We got a lot of participation. Um, here we go, JC, getting through. Will this apply? Oh, I guess we were talking about the, the uh, um, delayed, the 10 day extended um, background check process. It will, will, it, will this apply in Florida with FDLE for 18 year olds and in, in meeting the age exemption, LEO, military, et cetera? Yeah, there are certain age restrictions in Florida. Obviously, uh, you can't be 18 year old and buy certain firearms. Um, you know, they've they've created some new restrictions around that uh, under Florida statute. There are certain exemptions that must be met in order for an individual to buy a firearm, and uh, th those requirements uh, for the exemption must be met in order to transfer the firearm. So, if you can give us a little bit more detail about what you're asking there. 
Um, but yes, there are certain exemptions that can be uh, demonstrated to allow for a transfer. You just have to make sure that you're meeting those exemptions and have the proper documentation for that. Right. Is there a max to the extensions for 18, 19, 20 year olds? Meaning are they limited to just how long they can drag it out? The law um, allows for 10 days for them to uh, you know, get back to you on that. The law stipulates very specifically. However, uh, they can continue. And this goes not only for NICS, but point of contact states. I just dealt with this for Oregon. Um, you know, there are certain restrictions, but no, uh, that the uh, meaning are they limited to just how long they can drag it out. They've got 10, they've got essentially seven additional days above the original three or 72 uh, business days or 72 hours. And those are government business hours. So keep that in mind as it relates to the delay process. So they're still working out some of the kinks with this system as well. So uh, stay tuned for more on that. We're in constant communications with the NICS team on this. So just uh, be on the lookout for more information. Right. Uh, good question. I'm sorry we didn't cover it in this session, but what about gifting firearms during the holiday season? Just had a customer reach out today because his mom purchased a rifle for him online asking if he completes the 4473 since it's for him or his mom since she's the one that made the online purchase. Yeah, in this situation, um, when when they purchase a firearm for you online, that invoice or packing slip, whatever, is going to have your inf her information in this situation on that, and she will have to fill out that 4473. Now, keep in mind, 21A asks the question, are you the actual purchaser or buyer of this firearm? And in that case, she if, if it is legitimately a gift, you are not giving her anything in return. You're not trading anything, giving her, paying her back for buying that firearm, any of that. She can answer that question truthfully with a yes response. So keep that in mind. She is actually answering that question. She is the actual purchaser, buyer of the firearm, and then she can gift it to you. Now, our recommendation is always, and I know, you know, Second Amendment rights and un understand that everybody has a different purview of this, but our recommendation is always, you know what? Let her purchase the firearm and then do a transfer to you through an FFL. Have you fill out the 4473 so it's on the books uh, as belonging to you. Yeah. Right now, with, Bi with the Biden stuff going on, do it as tightly to the regulation as possible. Yep. Yeah. Don't leave any room for discretion. Um, thank you, Terry. In uh, Nebraska, said female caller asking to have someone else pick up the transfer. So yes, Nebraska, yep. you were in that area, one of those areas that we did hear about this happening with the uh, frequent calls by a uh, possible ATF sting. Yep. Just remember, it's whoever is on that invoice packing slip or whatever document came with the uh, firearm when it was to you. We get that question a lot uh, throughout the country. So yeah. if you're in Texas, just let me tell you, you are in a hotbed of ATF activity. Call us if you need us. Just getting a lot of Texas stuff here. Uh, been getting um, RK team and TH Treasurer, Western U United States. There is a separate email to send in 4473s for urgent trace requests. Yep, urgent at ATF.gov. Thanks, Tony, down at Tombstone. You guys are one of our one of our big clients. We really appreciate you, Tony. And the operators will tell you that. They'll they should be able to provide that other. Otherwise, it's the retail sales group at ATF, but that's the more routine traces. So it's urgent at ATF.gov. Pretty simple. Can you define for us when the 24 hours begins on a trace? Is it 24 hours from the time they send the email or is it 24 hours from the time we open it? It's 24 hours from the time they send the email, but they will typically call you. So just expect a phone call. Um, you know, yeah, they do email in certain situations, but once that email is received, the 24 hour window is click is, is ticking away. And, and John, how would that apply to, uh, receiving an email two hours after closing on a Friday night, for example? Yep. If your business hours are updated with the ATF licensing center, um, and those business hours, two hours after close on a Friday, um, you've got 24 hours from when you receive that email. So in that case, if they're sending it to you after business hours, you have 24 hours of the start of the next business day. Yeah. And if you close that, if that was on Friday night and you were closed Saturday and Sunday, your clock, you'd be held accountable to start at Monday morning, 8 a.m., right? Exactly, yeah. 
or whatever time your open time is that's registered with the FFLC. Right. If, if an active duty military uses PCS orders, does it have to be with his yes. military ID? Yes, you must see a military ID. And please don't photocopy the CAC card. It's actually a felony to do so. So yes, you would utilize the military ID for identification purposes. If a 19-year-old buys a long gun, can he purchase ammo for it since he is not 21? If, if they're purchasing a long gun, yes, they can absolutely purchase long gun ammunition. Yeah. And, and the question comes up frequently about the nine millimeter carbines. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as the configuration of the firearm is truly a rifle, uh, 18 and up can buy that fire, can buy that ammunition and that firearm, depending on your jurisdiction. Obviously, some states do have restrictions around that, but for the most part, if, if they're purchasing that ammunition for use in a long gun, in a firearm that they are legally allowed to have, then interchangeable ammunition, you as the FFL have the responsibility to ask that question. Yeah. And, and I've had to, I've explained, someone asked me this last week, how do I, how do I, how can I feel comfortable doing this? And he's like, how about, I said, how about if the, 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 the 19 year old has a picture or a video of him shooting his carbine at the range or sure. in the woods or, yeah, you know, or yeah, or showing it off on YouTube or whatever. That's all proof positive that you believe that person rightfully owns a, a, um, a, a carbine, nine millimeter, whatever. And you can legitimately feel good about selling him or her that ammunition. And if you really want to go far, far out there as far as being restrictive, we can always give you our perjury statement for that, to where you notify them that they are they're purchasing firearm ammunition that's interchangeable. And that they're purchasing it for a specific firearm and have them detail that firearm and have them sign that perjury statement. And that's if you want to get really restrictive. We do have some FFLs that make their customers fill out those perjury statements. Yeah. Are consignment returns considered pawn redemptions? No, ma'am. A consignment is a consignment. Just make sure that a consignment, you have to do a 4473 and a background check to return that firearm to the individual. Consignment and a pawn are two totally different things. Uh, JC, for you, you're the Florida guy here. If there has been no change to the proceed approval uh, FDLE re response for 27C, is it necessary to check off proceed again in box 27D or 27E? Um, Two-year-old FFL in Florida. Oh, so that, who, uh, uh, Mahindra in in Florida. If you want to, you can always call JC. His number is there on the screen and follow up with this. But uh, if you get a proceed from uh, FDLE or any other state or federal next agency to transfer a gun, you have up to thirty days right. from the certification date to to make that transfer. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. don't need. You and don't Florida need. To have... is one of those states where they have to give you an actual proceed. Yeah. But but you don't need if you get a proceed in, initially in box twenty seven C, you do not need to do anything in twenty seven D. Twenty seven D is just if you get a delay initial response <laughs> right. right from your agency, right? And twenty seven D is before the firearm has been transferred, and twenty seven E is after the firearm is transferred. In other words, you, you they met the con conditions maybe, and we've had this happen. You do receive that initial proceed, and then all of a sudden you get that phone call that something has changed after you've transferred the firearm. It's perfectly okay. You just need to make sure you update the 4473 in that case. Yep. Can a firearm say both multi and 5.56? Five, five, well, if it's a fully completed firearm, um, then it's whatever the actual firearm is chambered in. Um, if it is a receiver, uh, they can certainly mark it with multi 5.56. I don't, JB, have you seen one of those that way? No, no I, I've not... seen it. I've seen it marked in multiple calibers, but never a multi in a, a specific caliber. Yeah. I, yeah. When you look at the gun, like I said, if you get confused about this multi thing and it's, it shoots a bullet, you just got to figure out what bullet it shoots. <laughs> exactly. What's it chambered in? Yep. Yep. How many times the caliber on the barrel is hidden on ARs by the handgun? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically, what we find, especially, and, and this changes with 2021 R-05F, firearms that are being manufactured, manufactured from August 24th, 2022 forward are required to have that information marked on the receiver or frame. Now, what I will tell you is 
Yes. Uh, the vast majority of guns out there, sometimes that information's hidden. Uh, you'll find it at either the muzzle or you'll find it at the chamber at the bottom of the barrel. So look in those two areas. Sometimes it's right underneath the handguard and you can actually see it through one of the holes or vents on the handguard. So just do your diligence, make sure you're looking for it. Yeah, and I was at pawnbrokers all last week dealing with this as customers are bringing in ARs with all types of uh, uh, furniture on it and and, uh, and and accessories. And here's the bottom line. If you can't figure it out by examining and inspecting the firearm, ask the customer. The customer knows what type of ammunition they put in it. And, and that that's okay. If the customer says it's 300 blackout and you can't read it otherwise, you can list that as 300 blackout. All right. Do we need to keep the supplementary address proof attached to the 4473? Absolutely not. In 26B, you'll just simply document the issuing authority and what it was. You don't even have to. And we, I know like a month or two ago, we were talking about if there was an expiration date on any supplementary docs or if there was a control number, go ahead and document that. We, After speaking with our chief counsel, we've kind of changed our tune on that. The only thing that's required to be documented in 26B when you accept custom, uh, supplementary address information is who the issuing authority was and what it was you looked at. That is all that is required is to document that in 26B. Now, as an additional benefit or support for you, we do recommend maybe you keep a copy of that, but you keep a copy of it as a business record completely separate from the 4473 just in the event that you need to show proof or something comes into question, you have that document available for your purposes alone. So no, you do not need to keep a copy of anything with the 4473 as far as supplementary uh, address verification. I have never had an audit despite six years of operation. Well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're getting audited soon. <laughs> I, I did not keep proof of submission of 3310s in early years, but have copy of 3310 in the file. What can I do to not get revocation? Well, just because, you know, you didn't do it in the early years, chances are very good um, that they're not going to come in and look at six years of operations. Um, there's a number of factors that you have to take into consideration as to the likelihood of you being inspected. So definitely reach out to us at info at FFLconsultants.com so we can have a conversation with you about that. But as long as you're keeping evidence of it today, the chances are ATF, when they come in and inspect you, they're going to come in and inspect the previous 12 months of activity. That's the generally the norm unless there's something criminal going on. So if you're criminal, just be aware. <laughs> um, but <laughs> definitely reach out to us via email or give us a call. We'd be happy to talk to you about it just to kind of get a feel for where you're at and what the likelihood of, a, of an inspection is. Um, you know, six years, you're, you're pushing the envelope, but there are a number of different factors that fall into place. So as long as you've done it for the last 12 months, you should be pretty safe. What is the correct process to correct the A and D book in 4473 if multi was used for caliber? Say that again. What, what's the correct process for correcting 4473s in the A and D book if multi has been used for caliber in the past? Look, I wouldn't go any further than the last 12 months. Um, the correct process after a firearm has been transferred and you need to make a correction to the form is to go ahead and make a photocopy of the page where the error exists and make the correction on a photocopy and then attach that photocopied error correction page to the original 4473. Now, you've identified it yourself. Chances are your IOI is not going to cite you for those violations because you did do your due diligence and went back and corrected all those. Um, but, you know, it, there is a possibility of that. But I'd rather have you make those corrections and, you know, them call you out for the fact that, hey, this was wrong, but you fixed it rather than you knew it was wrong and didn't do anything to correct it. So. Um, all right. This is a test for you, JC. You may, we mentioned last month that there's now an email address of the denied Nick's checks. We actually received the denial, denial last week, but there was no request to email it in. Is there anything we should do? Typically, in that situation where you get a denial, a window is going to pop up and ask you for specifics from the 4473. 
Now, where are you at is the bigger question. Um, obviously, you go through Knicks, so I'm not really sure why you wouldn't have gotten that pop-up window. I am assuming you're using Enix. So, or the operator will ask you for it if you're calling it in still. So that's really unusual. Yeah, uh, Barry, just email me at jb at ffllconsultants.com. I'm, I'm looking at my file, but I, I don't see it easily, quickly. It's a new email address, but yeah, uh, just uh, just email me and I'll find it for you. Yeah, but that uh, is a very unusual scenario. Yeah. What is the correct process to, oh, we did that. Uh, what do you do with second copy of 3310.4 if law enforcement <laughs> says they don't want it? Um, here's the deal. And we we get this one quite a bit totally understand law enforcement doesn't want it how we tell you to socialize this with your local law enforcement agency is hey look i appreciate the fact that you will want it and whatever you do with it is fine by me that has nothing to do with me i'm just required by federal law to give it to you so you know please give me an email address or a fax number that i can submit it to and then if you want to delete it that's your priority that's your prerogative have a good time I'm not really concerned with that. I just need proof that I submitted it to you. It can be a challenge. We run into it quite a bit. Yeah. Just make sure you are submitting it. I don't care what you got in writing from the uh, Clio. I don't care about any of that. You are required to submit it no matter what. For multiple pistol sales, can you please confirm five business days? Is that for our company's operating hours? We're open two days a week for walk-ins. It'll be five business days. So if you're only open every Friday, say you're only open one day a week, all right? It's five Fridays. So if you're only open one day a week, Friday number one counts as one day, Friday number two counts as two days, so and so on. So it's five of your business days. Even if you're only open two days a week in this situation, it's it's going to be those uh two days and then two days and then one day and then you have to submit if, yep. if you get a reoccurring uh purchase yep. is the mossberg shockwave and similar um firearms uh, a handgun or other pistol grip mossberg shock, shockwave you can do other um we recommend firearm you can also use pistol grip firearm or pgf but uh mossberg shockwave uh we have documentation from atf that it is considered a quote unquote firearm. So yeah. remember, pistol, uh, a handgun, whether a pistol or a revolver, is meant to be shot by using one hand. And then a long gun or shotgun, a rifle or shotgun, is meant to be fired from the shoulder. Uh, neither of these meet that uh, the shockwave doesn't meet the definition of either of those situations. So you're going to document that as a firearm, both on the 4473 and your A and D record. Uh, but you are not wrong in utilizing other or pistol grip firearm or PGF either. And if you uh, want the ATF open ruling, uh, open letter on that, drop me an email. I'll send you the letter so you have it in hand and you don't yep. get in trouble for doing that in exactly. the future. Uh, and that letter, honestly, the only documentation is that letter from 2017. It says listed as a firearm, but to what JC says, um, I would say listed as a firearm unless you can get it in writing from somebody else at the ATF. Yep. Yep. As we say, get everything in writing from the ATF if they tell you to do something odd or irregular. Right. Does the multi-handgun and long gun form used in all states? Or is it only uh, the, the multi-handgun is used in all states? So the 3310.4 multiple handgun sale report is utilized in all states. All right. The 3310.12 multiple long gun sale is only utilized in those border states to Mexico. That is your Arizona, your New Mexico, your Texas, and California. So if you are not a Mexico border state, you are not required to submit the 3310.12. I don't know what this is totally in relation to JC, but it says, do they have to answer 21.2 or can they leave it blank? 21. Not exactly. Uh, Vivian, if you can give us a little more. Oh, I think she's, she, maybe Vivian is saying 21L.2, um, the non-immigrant alien questions. Yeah. Um, at the bottom. So do they have to answer it? If they're a non-immigrant alien, then yes. If they are a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, then that that question could be left blank. 
Stripped lower, uh, stripped lower would just be multi, yes. uh, correct? Stop calling them stripped lowers or stripped receivers or completed receivers or completed lowers. They are just a receiver. I don't care if it has a stock on it, a buffer spring tube. I don't care about any of that. They are just a lower or a receiver. So stop calling them stripped and completed, first of all. But yes, a strip lower can, should be called a uh, or should have the caliber of multi because you don't know what it's going to be chambered in when it's been completed. Yeah. Does a blank receiver <laughs> does a blank receiver be listed in section five as multi or NA? So that would multi. be multi. Yeah, multi. That is a caliber is multi on a receiver. Yep. Caliber is always multi. Yeah, yeah. no firearm. Unless it's firearm. marked otherwise. Unless it is marked otherwise. We do see receivers and frames that are actually marked with a specific caliber. So yeah. Okay. Um, hi guys. I left a few, I, I have, I sell a few combo guns. Yep. I need a 22 caliber over 20 gauge. I just put both yep. 22 caliber and 20 gauge in number five on a 4473. Yep. You must do that in the 4473 and your A&D record. If it is a multi-caliber list, both. And in this situation, it'll be dot two, two slash 20 GA. If you want to use GA, um, that's totally acceptable. Yeah. If you got the judge, it's a four, four, 0.45 slash 410. Can a vehicle registration tag tax receipt issued by State Department of Revenue be used for supplementary documentation? Yep, it fulfills the requirement. It's government issued. You have the issuing authority and what it is. Ah, uh, congratulations to Jamie. Get sent in. Uh, the, the, it's the, the fax line for the denied faxes or e actually emails to uh, Nick's is actually D-E-N-I for deny, D-E-N-I-F-A-X-L-I-N-E -E at ATF.gov. It's weird. It's deny fax line at ATF.gov, and it's an email address. So thank you, Jamie, for uh, sending that in. Uh, is it okay to list the shockwave style firearm as a shotgun on a 4473 AMD book? No. No. It does not meet the definition of a shotgun. A shotgun is a shoulder-fired firearm. A shockwave is a firearm, other, or pistol grip firearm, or PGF. Those are the only options you can use. I'd like to go back to the multi, multi on the receiver. Getting a lot of questions on this. I'm glad we talked about it then. If it is a strip lower, understand we can put multi in the a and book and on the 4473. In these cases, I usually indicate marked multi in the case of rifles and have multi on a receiver, but the rifle is say 5.56. My IOI told me I could put marked multi configured 5.56 NATO in the caliber block. Uh, if it is truly just a receiver and it is not completed firearm, you need to document, notate whatever it is actually stamped as. So if it's multi, you this put is a rifle, line. John. This is a rifle. Oh, it's a fully completed rifle. Yeah. Oh, okay, fully completed rifle is whatever it's chambered in. Yeah. That is yeah, required. You cannot use multi. You can put both, but you need you 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 can put both, but you have to actually put what it's chambered in as well. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason to put multi if you know no, it's, it's a 556. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's overkill. And uh, believe me, you, there's a lot of all IOIs out there, John. What's your favorite term? That's the um oh the code of IOI regulations. They do not exist. They are not factual in any way, shape, or form. It's completely made up. So, you know, as JB mentioned earlier, if an IOI tells you to do something and it doesn't sound right to you, whether or not it sounds right to you, tell them to send you an email just so you have it documented. Because you may not get that IOI the next time you have an inspection. Right. Some older receivers have no markings. We've put them in the a and as none marks. Should it be multi? No, if nothing's marked on older receivers, that's not unusual. You can certainly put none marked. Yeah, if if a, if a firearm has a barrel on it, it should never. It's not multi. Just, <laughs> just stop right, right there. Yeah. 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 All right. It's it's whatever the barrel is chambered in. Okay. Are they going to ding us if we, as a, or a customer, make a correction and initials it, but does not date the correction? Yeah, you know, it really depends on your IOI. Atypically, I would tell you that I haven't seen any cited violations for this. They'll call you out for the on the inspection as well as in your closing conference to make sure that from that point forward, you do get initials and dates of corrections on the 4473. 
So I would tell you, could could you be cited? Possibly, but it would be unusual. Yeah, but 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 in today's day and age, why not? Yeah, why why not yeah. just do what the book says to do? Yeah, I'm, you I'm are doing. required per instructions in the forty four seventy three and the code of regulations for um, corrections to be initialed and dated. Yep, and one line, <laughs> not yep. scribbles. Yeah, and, single and, line and not, through, strike through. Yep. Yeah. I could have I could have shown you another 30 or 40 great examples of what not to do. There's white out. There's all types of things you just don't uh, want to do. Yeah, don't do white out. For yeah. the love of God, no white out. Yeah. That's a no-no. I, yeah. I have 11 stripped lowers and already listed a, as 556 in my A&D book. Can I just write multi on top of that? I have 11 stripped lowers and already listed five five six. Oh, did, did, yeah, uh, yeah, you can just if, yeah. if they're just lowers, if they're just receivers, Single line out that five five six, and write in multi initial and date it. But but Steve, but Steve, if they're marked, if the receivers are stamped five five six, you have to leave right. it as five five six. Right. <laughs> if it's marks five five six, leave it five five six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, How okay. do you correct the A and D book if NA was listed as caliber? Like we just mentioned to Steve, if if you put an NA for caliber for a, a lower or receiver. Go ahead and line out NA, single line strike through initial and date it and put multi or whatever stamped on that receiver or frame. Yep. When a correction is made in box in the date box 23, a certification date, do they uh -huh. need to initial each month, day, year box? So there's three initials for each. No, just go ahead and initial one date once. Yeah. Okay. And and, and he, a lot of times we see that people just mess up the year. I mean, they don't, have, if, if, if today's 11, 14, 20, 22, and I put 11, 14, 20, 21, I really only need to cross out the 21 at the end and, or the two right. at the end to make it a one, uh, cross out the one, make it a two. Right. We don't, we don't need to cross out all three boxes and write a new date. Just fix the number that's in the error. Yep. Our NSSF mock audit said not to, do any 40 or NSSF mock audit said not to redo any 4473, just make corrections, even to yes, no questions. I prefer to redo so it's clean. And, and yeah, I mean, I don't, we don't know who came to see you, Marcia, but but yeah, I mean, you can ask a customer to redo the form anytime you want before you transfer a gun or before you tr before you do the background check. Am I correct, JC? Yeah, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, most of the um, providers out there now, if somebody screws up a form electronically as they're going through the process and has to redo it, um, basically that becomes an abandoned 4473 and they redo it. So it's yeah, totally up to you. I mean, you, yeah, you're, whoever you had out from the NSSF that told you that, um, I mean, maybe they, they may have been an old ATF person or something. Maybe their recommendation is is just you know to have them correct whatever errors are made, but by all means you can absolutely have them start over if they screw something up. And, and guys, you can set the rules. I have one dealer who allows one error. If there's yep. more than one error, it's a do over. <laughs> yep. You know we have dealers uh, that actually will make them start over again, but will attach the form that the customer screwed up to that forty four seventy three just because they screwed up so much stuff. So. Yeah, you don't want it looking like a uh, haywire when uh, the ATF inspector looks at it. Uh, it was on NSSF 4473 training videos to no redo the form. So, so what you're getting on NSF training videos is former ATF inspectors. Yeah. Uh, any ATF inspector would love to see as much as they can about your business so that they can dive deep into it. I I, I never heard that the, NS, that the ATF is out to say, happy day, everybody, every time they visit you. <clears throat> You know, the training is to identify failures in your process, uh, violations of law, and they do so by finding irregularities in your process and on your forms and in your paperwork. So as a, as a non-ATF inspector, as a former business firearm sporting goods business person, I say present that ATF with the most, with the cleanest, valid, um, decipherable, um, uh, legitimate legal documents that you can. Uh, and follow the process and why present all the garbage when you can present most everything clean. Yep. 
uh, expedite, it'll expedite your inspection. It'll re re reduce and eliminate your errors and citable violations and the questions that inspector will ask of you throughout the process. Keep them clean, as we say, right? Yep. All right. Wow. That was it. it. Hey, we wow, everybody. went over a half an hour. <laughs> well, listen, once again, you guys have been great. We appreciate your support and loyalty. If you found this valuable, please give us a, a, a thumbs up on a Google review. Um, call us throughout the holidays. We will be sure to push any important, critical, time-sensitive information to you. Uh, but JC and I are here anytime you you email or call or text. And um, what else, JC? Uh, that's it. That's all I got. Okay, so we'll see you guys before shot show, shot show. Some probably we're just surmising somewhere around the tenth or or fifteenth of January. Uh, we wish you happy holidays and happy selling. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone.